Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Pat Doris. We begin with a salute to a volunteer firefighter in St. Paul, Oregon, someone who gave his time and effort to help keep his community safe and paid the ultimate price. We think you should know about him. His name is Austin Smith and today his community honored him. KGW's Galen Etlin is live in St. Paul now with that story. Galen. Yes, Pat, so many emotions here for this community. That memorial service for Austin Smith wrapped up in the last hour or so here at the St. Paul Rodeo, and a lot of people showed up, as you can imagine. It was a rough count, but I'd say about a thousand people or so, maybe more, packed the stands from all over Oregon. Now, if you don't know, Austin Smith died earlier this month from injuries he got while responding to a barn fire. Many in the crowd shed tears this afternoon during the ceremony. He grew up here in St. Paul, so people really felt the impact of his volunteer service. And his friends and family members say he was dedicated to community and was the life of the party. He was so special in that light. To know Austin was to love him. Austin, you are one in a million, and there will never be a day that passes where we won't think of you. You will leave a void that will be hard to fill. So lastly, I ask each and every one of you to make a difference. Austin Smith leaves behind a wife and extended family here in St. Paul, and we've got a lot more background about him on KGW.com. But as you can imagine, today is really about remembering him and the legacy that he leaves behind. And of course, the community is really hurting through this. Yeah, Back to you. inspiring, but very difficult. Thank you, Galen. Police in Vancouver are asking for your help to find a child who went missing Friday afternoon. Have you seen him? This is 12 year old Jay Hunter. Jay was last seen at Y East Middle School. He's described as having black hair and brown eyes. The preteen is four foot five and weighs about 90 pounds. He was last seen wearing an orange and blue shirt, gray jeans, white shoes, and had black and gray backpack. If you know where he is or if you've seen him, please call 911. Well, voters in our area have consistently said homelessness is the biggest problem facing our area, and many are still very frustrated that there's no solution. Well, former Portland mayor Sam Adams, who's an aide to the current mayor, Ted Wheeler, has a big idea on how to fix that. Even he admits it may be a bit startling. Adams proposed creating up to three different large homeless shelters that would hold a thousand people each. It would be staffed by unarmed members of the National Guard and social work graduate students. The idea is that those shelters would eliminate the need for unsanctioned camping and it would be no longer allowed. At least one local shelter agrees with the end result of Adam's idea. This requires an emergency response, just like, you know, how we respond to forest fires. We are in the midst of a humanitarian crisis. The Union Gospel Mission's Jason Christensen said his team has met many times with houseless campers and that the conditions they live in are inhumane. Some advocates for the homeless have rejected the Sam Adams idea. You can read the entire thing for yourself at KGW.com. Homelessness is number one. The second biggest problem a lot of people have mentioned in Portland is crime. And now a popular Mexican eatery has had enough and it's getting out of Portland, moving to Tigard because of crime, they say. Christelle Kumwe is live in the newsroom with more. Christelle? Yes, so Tamale Boy has three locations, one in Happy Valley, another one in northeast Portland, and the headquarters on North Russell. Now, the owner says after a tough year of break-ins and little to no help from the city, they're ready to move to HQ. Um, that's kind of my, my, my plan to get over there. Jaime Soltero Jr. started his business, Tamale Boy, out of a food truck in 2010 before opening his first brick-and-mortar restaurant on North Russell Street in Portland. It's a, my commissary kitchen, my central kitchen, where I produce all of our food. It's, uh, it's also our catering, uh, the head where I do all of my catering. Now, more than a decade later, he's ready for change. Decided to relocate my headquarters. I'm just going to move out, move out of uh, Portland. Saltero says the crime rate in the city has taken a toll on the business. Two, three times a year I get broken into, not only at this location, but at my Decom location as well. Um, so I'm just kind of, you know, that, that takes a toll on, on us financially and with our employees, you know, the safety. He reached out to the city but says not much has been done. Every time you're, you feel like you're making progress, something like this happens and it just, it, it's demoralizing and it's frustrating because nothing's really being done. Um, and, you know, these people are just getting away with it. There's, there's no recourse. The plan now is to relocate the operation to Tigard. I know that there's other places that are willing to have, you know, to have me around and, 
and they'll do the best they can to, to make it happen. And that's kind of the vibe that I've been getting from uh, when I called Tigard. While the headquarters will eventually move, Saltero says the Northeast Deacon and Happy Valley locations will stay open. Of course it's always sad because it's yeah, I've never uh, really given up on a place. Um, I've always had, uh, you know, I've always been able to pull through and succeed. And we're just, you know, here to support each other and try to get through this the best way we can. The Tamale Boy on North Russell Street isn't going anywhere just yet. Saltero says he still has about four years left on the lease, so it will be a while before he can actually relocate. Pat. All right, thank you, Christelle. Switching gears now to transportation, a reminder for you drivers in Clark County and beyond heading south toward Portland later tonight. The southbound span of I-5 on Interstate Bridge will be closed starting at 1030. That southbound span will be closed until 7 tomorrow morning. Bridge crews will be working on cables and other maintenance issues. For a detour, you can take Highway 14 East I-205, sidewalks on the southbound span and the northbound lanes of I-5 will remain open on the interstate bridge. One of the founders of the Dutch Brothers Coffee may have his plans for a major horse racing track in nearby entertainment center in Grants Pass shot down. The Oregon Attorney General released an opinion Friday which called the plan for 225 betting machines at the entertainment center a casino, which violates Oregon law. Travis Borsma has said he's invested $50 million to keep live horse racing going in Oregon at that Grants tr Pass track and the nearby entertainment center. But Oregon's nine federally recognized Native American tribes have objected. They earn much of their money from reservation casinos. In yesterday's announcement, Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum says because the games are that of chance and not skill, they would violate two provisions of Oregon's constitution. The state's racing commission will have the final say, but this opinion may doom the whole idea. Borsma said he's disappointed, but remains committed to saving horse racing in Oregon. This past week, a man convicted of a vicious murder when he was 16 years old was ordered set free. After 30 years, Todd Davila won his freedom based on new sentencing rules for juveniles that's being applied retroactively. Tim Gordon spoke with the prosecutor who's lived with this case and its many appeals for 20 years. Convicted murderer Todd Davila went before a judge over his sentence for a seventh time, and this time he got his freedom. Davila is 46 now. In 1991, he was 16 years old when he forced his way into Lisa Flormo's Wilsonville home and attempted to rape her. When Flormo resisted, Davila stabbed her in the throat with his Boy Scout knife, repeatedly killing her. Since Davila was originally sentenced, the rules have changed over time. In this case, for what minors convicted of murder serve for their crime. Chief Deputy DA Chris Owen has been on the case for 20 years and through five of the resentencing hearings. He explains it like this. So our office always sought exceptional sentences given the, the, the really vicious and horrific nature of the crime, um, but they would be appealed and the uh, appellate courts would say that our sentence or the sentence handed down by the court as requested by the prosecution was always too high. So we were moving forward in sentencing, we were always on a constant march downwards. All along that march has been Lisa Flormo's family, attending the hearings and sharing their painful story. And this week, imploring the judge to keep Davila in prison. When I hear about Todd Davila's rights, I, I think about, you know, where are Lisa's rights here? Where's her right to life? Where are, where are our rights as a family to have her with us? Owen says, like many victims' loved ones. And sometimes they feel their voice is lost in the process, but Lisa Flormo's family was steadfast um, in their dedication to this case because that's what they thought they could do for Lisa, is to be there for her every time. This time, the judge adjusted Davila's sentence from 50 to 25 years. He's already served 30. That was based on the latest guideline that does not allow what may amount to a life sentence for a juvenile convicted of a single murder. It means the end of court hearings for a family that otherwise would have kept showing up for Lisa. They are a wonderful family. Um, they, they get it. They understood the challenges and the complications. Um, they were supportive of our work. Um, and we did our best to support them through this very difficult time. Davila's next step is post-prison supervision for the rest of his life. 
Tim Gordon, KGW News.